So uh, let me officially welcome you to the uh, 2017 Southeastern Cowboy Gathering. This is the uh, first official event, and I'm uh, glad to have you all out. I'm Seth Hopkins, the director of the museum. For those of you I might not know, welcome to the booth, and uh, we're going to have a great weekend of activities. And uh, this afternoon, this evening, is all about our friend Chris Navarro and his uh, wonderful sculpture exhibit. I think our staff has outdone themselves in putting this one together and uh, working in so many interesting pieces and elements from Chris's life and uh, showing some of his monuments. So if you would, give our staff a round of applause. And uh, whenever we talk sculpture, uh, people immediately want to know, how do you melt the wax and how do you pour the bronze and all that kind of stuff. So uh, Chris said he got so tired of answering that question over the years that uh, he created that video that we're running over there. So if you have questions about that, um, come back when the volume's turned up and uh, check out that video. So we'll, we'll try to stay away from uh, the casting questions. Uh, now, Chris is a lot smarter than me. He made that five minute video. I would say if you want to know about casting, come by when you have an hour and 15 minutes and we'll get a cup of coffee and I'll tell you about the easy 31 step lost wax casting process. But his video probably does a better job in five minutes. We're going to uh, move around a little bit and talk about some different pieces. And uh, we're going to try to spend a little more time on pieces in here than the ones in his uh, 7 o'clock talk down in the theater. So you do need to try to catch both. And then hopefully if you get inspired, you might want to come back tomorrow when he's going to do a demo uh, tomorrow. And we're going to have a live model. And he's going to do a uh, full figure sculpture in two hours and 27 minutes. I'm going to try. It might be a heck of a wreck. It could be. But uh, you'll have to come and see. But uh, we do have a few slots left in that. If you're interested, see our front desk, and they can get you hooked up with that. Uh, very reasonable price for uh, what you're going to get out of that. But uh, enough said about that. Um, they say you don't have to be crazy to be a bull rider, but it helps. And uh, Chris uh, certainly uh, had his time in the uh, bull riding arena. And so I thought maybe we'd start with this piece right here. I can tell you a little bit about his experiences first as a bull rider and how he decided that uh, it was moderately safer to be a sculptor. Only moderately so. But I'll let uh, Chris take it from there. Well, thanks, uh, everybody, for coming out today. It's, uh, it's a big honor to be here at the booth and working with Seth. It's been a pleasure. And everybody, in fact, I'm not, I haven't been to Georgia that much, but I've been really impressed with how friendly everybody is here and it makes you really feel at home. And, hospitable and like I said uh, I'm really enjoying my time here in Georgia so the story on my career it began when uh, I was at the ripe old age of 23 I started sculpting but before that my first real passion and love was horses and uh, when I was a little boy I wanted to be a cowboy ever since my mom said I was two and a half years old and she got me a pair of red cowboy boots and I, I wore them for three days before she let me I'd let her take them off so she said, for some reason, I wanted to be one, you know, and, and I didn't grow up in any ranching or cowboy background. I, I grew up in a family of uh, military aviators, really. So where that love came from, I don't know. But I've always wanted to be a cowboy, and a cowboy's always got to have a horse. So I was fortunate. I was uh, 12 years old when I had the first horse was ever given to me, and with some other people that were stationed in the military, and they had to leave. They were transferred over to Germany. And they said that we got this horse, and we just, because Chris loves to come out and ride him, we're just going to give him to him. And that's how I got my first horse. It cost me nothing. But, uh, you know, I didn't even have a saddle for the first year. I'd ride that horse bareback everywhere I went. And, uh, and that really made me into a good rider. And it really helped in my, later on in my rodeo career. Riding a horse bareback is good training for riding rough stock or anything because you're always working on your balance and everything. And I didn't know any better. I was just a kid riding Indian style and having a good time. So uh, when I got a little bit older, I started uh, showing and training horses, and I joined 4-H. And we were stationed at Wright-Patterson at the time, which is in Dayton, Ohio. And there's a big horse culture out there, and uh, a lot of quarter horse shows and everything like that. So I started showing horses and pleasure and trail, and I'd show them in uh, halter. And, you know, it was exciting to me. You know, you'd win a ribbon, and, you know, I mean, I was... 14, 15 years old when I was doing that. And that's what I thought I wanted to be, is become a professional horse trainer. So uh, 
that kind of ended though later on when uh, we got transferred to Europe and my dad was stationed in Torjon Air Force Base in Madrid. So we went there and uh, there's a real horse culture in Spain still. I mean, the Spanish have had horses for a very long time and it's a very interesting culture. They even have a remount service there where you can go rent a stallion for just paying his insurance and you get to, uh, if you have 16 mares, you can go rent any stud they got. These are million dollar horses and you just have to give them the first rights to uh, a male colt if they want to own it. So anyways, I ended up getting a horse there and I start, kept riding and training a few horses there and then I went to a rodeo. It was, uh, I was 16 years old and I was at a naval base on the Mediterranean called Rota. And there was uh, these guys, these guys were all like Marines and Seabees and they were riding these bucking horses and bulls. And I remember I was sitting in the stands with my little sister and I said, I think that looks like some fun, something I'd like to do. So I uh, talked to my parents into signing a release. And my mom goes, I'm not gonna sign a release for you to ride bulls, but if you wanna get on some bucking horses, I'll, I'll sign a release. I said, all right. Well, that only lasted about two weeks and I talked her into signing the release for the bulls too, so. And I started riding bulls then, and uh, and I tell you what, I, I liked riding bulls more than I liked riding bareback bronx because uh, I don't know what it was about bulls. Something about them just drew me more to them. And uh, all that bareback riding made me kind of, uh, I was kind of a quick study, and I started beating these older guys fairly quickly. In fact, uh, I won the, uh, the, it's not a real big title, but I was, I, like when I was 17 years old, I won the championship bareback bronc riding title for Spain between the two bases. And I thought, well, I'm, I'm doing something I really like, and this is what I want to do for a living. I want to ride bucking horses and bulls for a living. And my parents said, well, you got to go to college. So I found a college with a really good rodeo team in Wyoming. It's called Casper College, and they'd won the world championships in the college division four out of four years in the 60s. And I thought, well, that's a place where I want to go to school. And I'd never even been to Wyoming, so... We got transferred back, and uh, all my, my, my roots are really from San Antonio, Texas. That's where both my parents are from. So I rode uh, a lot of bull riding down in San Antonio around Texas. So I got to get on a bunch of bulls. And, and I, I think that was the summer I, uh, I uh, got my front teeth knocked out that summer. And then uh, I went to college. So I, I drove all the way up to Casper, Wyoming, and I, and I started riding bulls and uh, bareback bronx up there for the school. And uh, something about Wyoming, you know, I, I grew up in a military family, but I'd never been to Wyoming, and I just loved it up there. It's a beautiful country. There's not a lot of people live there. And uh, I, I settled there, and I've been living there ever since. So rodeo had been a big part of my life. And then uh, in uh, the late 70s, I just got tired of being broke and being busted up and not having any money. So I decided to quit riding bulls and go get me a real job, as my dad said. And my real job was working in the oil field. And I worked there and uh, I was probably in 1979, I happened to go by and I saw that bronze by Harry Jackson. They have it downstairs right now, because Harry Jackson's from Wyoming and he was a great sculptor and uh, I got to know Harry pretty well later. But I didn't even know who he was, but I just saw that piece and it really sparked spark in me and made me want to become a, a sculptor. Because I said, I used to ride bucking horses, and that thing was beautiful, and I wanted to have it. So I started my, my, my career. Uh, I was pretty naive about everything. I didn't really know what I was doing, but I just knew I wanted to do it. So the first sculpture I ever made was a bull rider. And I entered it in a, uh, the foundry owner guy, he entered it in a contest, and I won $15 in a blue ribbon. So I thought I was onto something, and... Uh, and I probably, you know, it's something that I really have a passion for. So I thought if I was going to do my very first sculpture, I want to do something about that really resonated with me. So I made a bull rider. And then this piece came along in 1992. Lane Frost was a world champion bull rider. I don't know, a lot of you guys have seen that movie. It's called Eight Seconds. Uh, Luke Perry played him in the movie. And uh, he was only 25 years old. And he was the world champion in 1987. And he was killed in 1989 at Cheyenne by a bull. This is the bull that killed him. The bull that killed him was called Taking Care of Business. And, uh, but he had horns like this. And he was a big bull like this one. And uh, what happened to Lane is he wasn't wearing a protective vest. They didn't have him developed back then. When I rode bulls, they didn't have helmets, protective vests. Nobody wore a mouthpiece. It was just get on and hold on. 
But, you know, bull riding's really beginning to be a big sport now, especially out here in the east even, you know, and um, North Carolina is a hotbed for bull riding right now. Well, anyway, so uh, what's kind of a, a, a unique story about Lane Frost, he'd drawn this bull a couple weeks before, and the same bull had bucked him off, and he, he told his uh, riding partner back there, Jim Sharp, he said, I'm going to get him this time. I'm going to ride this bull. And he did ride him, and he scored, uh, I think it was 86, one second in the rodeo, but when he come off that bull, it was a real muddy arena, and he got thrown down on his hands and knees, and then that bull saw him and turned around and, and, and put a horn into him. And it, it broke his ribs, and it, and it punctured his uh, aorta, and he died right there on the arena. And one of his traveling partners was named by Cody Lambert. He's one of the founders of the PBR. And he came up. Two years later, he started developing the protective vests that the cowboys wear today. And it's mandatory now. You can't go to any bull riding anywhere in the country and not see the cowboys wearing these protective vests. And his best friend made that vest. And if Lane Frost would have been wearing that vest, he wouldn't have been killed. So that's something kind of remarkable about that story, how the protective vest came about. And uh, they just passed a new law in the PBR. Like, if you're born after 1996, you're going to have to wear a helmet. So... For years from down the road, 10 years from now, you won't see any bull riders not riding without a helmet. And I think that's a good thing. I mean, it doesn't look as good. I mean, I'm going to sculpt a guy with a cowboy hat on. I mean, but it makes sense. In fact, my son was a professional bull rider in the PBR for about six years. And uh, as soon as he told me he was going to ride bulls, I went out and bought him a helmet. Because that's just a way of making your career last a lot longer. Because, you know, the bad side about downside of bull riding is you're going to get hurt doing it. It's a guarantee. It's not maybe. If you think it is, then you just didn't get on enough bulls because there's going to be one that's going to hurt you somewhere down the road. And that's kind of the biggest drawback of bull riding because I love doing it. I mean, I wasn't making any money, and I'm risking my health and everything else, but I was just drawn to it where I just couldn't stop doing it. So when I quit riding, I thought I wanted to do find something I really loved, and I was just working for a paycheck, working in the oil field, and then I, I saw that bronze by Harry, and it made me want to do sculptures. And this is the first public monument I ever did. And like I said, I did this in 1992. I started on the project. And I was able to raise the money for this because nobody commissioned me to do this. I commissioned myself. So here I am doing my first public monument. And it wasn't like Cheyenne Frontier Days came to me and said, Chris, we'd like you to do this big monument for Lane Frost. That, that wasn't the way it happened. I approached them and said, I'd like to do this big monument for Lane Frost for Cheyenne Frontier Days. And I said, I'd like you guys to help me with the fundraising, and we can raise the money, and we can do it. And they turned me down. And I said, really? I said, well, uh, I'll raise all the money myself. And the reason I, how I did it, I thought, if you go ask people to give you $1,000, you're not going to get that many people. But if you give them something in return that's worth more than that $1,000, then they'll, they'll help you out. And so I made a small one of this bronze, 18 inches tall. And I told everybody that donated a bronze, I mean, $1,000 would get the bronze, and they'd get their name on the plaque at the base of this monument. And you look right below this plaque, you ever go to Frontier Days, there's a couple hundred names underneath there, honoring everybody that helped make this happen. And that thing just took off, and I was able to raise all the money and do it. And this piece is always going to probably be the most special piece to me, and uh, it's because of all the hard things I went through to get it done. When, uh, when Cheyenne turned me down, I, I turned that into a yes. And then... Uh, Right when I get to start on it, my dad suffered a stroke and died. And uh, he was going to come to the dedication, I remember. In fact, it was one of the last things I talked to him about was he was making plans to come to Cheyenne for the dedication. And uh, I even carved his name in the base of it. A lot of people don't know that because uh, he had planned on coming and didn't make it. Self I'm self-educated. I'm not self-taught. I've learned from a lot of other artists. But when I first started, I, I was pretty... I was pretty ignorant about everything, to be honest with you. And that's why I was telling Seth earlier, I says, you know, to be a, a lot of people don't understand, but bull riding was probably one of the best trainings I could get to be a professional artist. Because, you know, to be a, a good bull rider, you need a lot of confidence and you need a lot of ignorance. And, and I had plenty of both. <laughs> and so I didn't know what I was getting into when I wanted to be a sculptor. I just knew I wanted to do it. But, you know, a lot of people ask me if I'm self-taught. I, I mean, I'm self-educated, I like to say, not self-taught, because I've learned from other people. Like, just looking at Harry's work, I learned a lot just looking at his work. So, 
unless you live in a vacuum, I don't think there's anybody that's going to be completely self-taught. So I've kind of like wanted to do something and leave my mark. And I thought, you know, if I live this big monument for Lane Frost, it'll, it's always going to be there. And that's one of the great things I love about bronze. It's such a tough, durable medium. I mean, you can pick this sculpture up by this tail, and this thing weighs 75 pounds, and I can pick it up by this tail. And it's got such a tensile strength that you can do that with this sculpture. And I try to make my sculptures where they look like they're suspended in air, like this eagle against the sun. You look at it, and that's a bronze that's held up, and that's a big bronze. That's, uh, that eagle's got over a six-foot wingspan and that ring, and I wanted to show all that negative space in there. And I couldn't do that with any other medium but bronze and stainless steel. So I try to uh, exploit bronze. And there's another one that, that sculpture on the top is called When Champions Meet. That's a 15 foot tall saddle bronc rider I did for uh, the Greeley Stampede. And they saw my Lane Frost. And th that, their arena is only like uh, 40 miles from Cheyenne's arena. And they said, man, we'd like to have one like that in front of ours. So that's how I came up with that job. And then if you look at this Eagle Dancer, I did this for my school and uh, where I went to college, they're the Thunderbirds. And you look at that piece is 15 feet tall also, but he's all held up on one foot. He's, he's standing on his tiptoes. And I kind of sculpted it uh, a little bit thicker down there and ran some stainless steel up there. But that's a great thing about bronze is all the exploits you can do with it. You can't do that with rock or, or wood or, or about any other medium, really get hold sculptures up in the weight because all the tinsel strength. So I tried to take advantage of that. But getting back to rodeo, and that's kind of how I got started and, and I just, I love doing rodeo sculptures. The only thing bad about rodeo sculptures, they're, they're not real sellable because most of the people that like rodeo don't have any money. <laughs> but you know what, I can still continue to do them. And I do the trophy for the Calgary Stampede and I did the trophy for the Bull Riders Only World Champion. I mean, you know, you just gotta do the things that really resonate with you and you have a passion about. I can't sculpt things unless I, I feel really kind of passionate and good about them. I'll turn a job down now, I mean, if somebody wants me to do a portrait of them and their dog or something like that, I mean, that doesn't interest me that much. So, But if somebody says, hey, you want to do a bucking horse jumping up in the air or, or a bull, you know, I'm all for doing that because I, I got a belief in it. Speaking about uh, doing sculptures for people who do have money, how about talking about this one right in front of you? Oh, yeah, this is a duality. This is a, a bronze I did. It was about a lady wanted me to do a sculpture about the bull and the bear stock market. Her husband was a trader. And I said, I've seen some, you know, a few bronzes done where the bull and the bear are fighting. And I thought, well, I'll come up with a unique idea. Do not, do not try this in the gallery. <laughs> I wanted to make this bronze reversible. This bronze is reversible. So if you look at it one way, the bull is beating the bear. But then you can flip it over, and now the bear is putting a whooping on the bull. <laughs> I'd never seen a reversible sculpture before. So I thought, well, that's kind of a unique way to show the piece and tell the story. And, and I try to do my work because, you know, I mean, there's a lot of bronzes that have been done out there, and it's hard to find a unique kind of presentation for them. But I've been trying to come up with some unique ideas, and uh, hopefully I've been able to accomplish that a few times. You would uh, talk about the relationship between the small pieces to the monumental ones that are shown in the photographs. Okay.